Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zataran's authentic New Orleans-style dinner mixes. Zataran's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Hello, I'm Chef John Fultz. Food is so much more than nutrition here in the South. Every weekend on Louisiana's Back Roads and Bayous, our festivals celebrate the food, music, and cultures that make us unique. Why not join me as we visit the fairs and festivals of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Other than chicken, pork is without a doubt the most versatile and often used meat on any South Louisiana table. Just about every culture in the world has its preferred method of cooking a pig whole. The Chinese have their beggar's pork, the Hawaiians have their luau, and here in Louisiana we have our cushion delay. The art of cooking a pig over an open wood fire dates back here to about the 1800s and there's been reason to celebrate ever since. So why not join me and a few of my friends as we go down to Mansoura, Louisiana to celebrate the Cushon Delay Festival. Come on guys, let's go, let's go, come on, let's go, come on. Down lovely Louisiana Highway 1, there's a small town known for its French traditions and southern hospitality. This town, incorporated in 1860, is named Mansoura, the Cushon de Lake capital of the world. Ex-soldiers of Napoleon's army settled this area after their last campaign in Mansoura, Egypt, and named the town in its honor. In celebration of their centennial, a party was thrown in Cushon de Lake, our fire-roasted suckling pig was served, and it's been a tradition here ever since. 20 to 30 pound pigs are cooked over hickory fires until golden brown and falling from the bones. Visitors come here from around the world to enjoy this delicacy, and I think we should all be there to greet them next May in Mansoura at the Cushon Delay Festival. <laughs> How did you like my friends going down to the Cushon Delay Festival? Wow, what a day that was down there playing with my little pigs. One of the great things about festivals in general that I think is the most important thing about fairs and festivals of Louisiana is that every weekend there's four or five of them happening somewhere and some are so unique, they, you have to attend them, and the Cushon Delay Festival is one of them. Because where else are you going to get fire-roasted pork, a tradition that goes back a couple hundred years in Louisiana, and every culture in the world, as I mentioned, has some method of fire-roasting or cooking not only pork, but game and all other animals before an open hearth fire. But we've lost that tradition for some reason. But here in Louisiana, you can go down to Mansoura, watch the process, recreate right before your eyes, especially for the younger generation. And that's what fairs and festivals, in my opinion, are all about. And you should search them out in your own state. I think we just about have the license for every one of them with four or five hundred different food and cultural festivals. And if you can't find them in your own hometown, hey, guess what? Come see us. We have a bunch of them, and we'll be happy to let you enjoy them just as we do every weekend. Now, Cushon Delay Festival, you have to have a great cook. And my guest in the kitchen today is not only a great cook, somebody who knows a lot about Cushon Delay, somebody who knows a lot about fire roasting, open hearth cooking, Paul Keeney. I call him the hearth master. He's, he's the guy who knows a lot about cooking on open hearth. He taught me a lot about it. The little bit that I know, uh, he's taught me, and he's going to be in the kitchen. He's from Orange Grove Plantation, and most people know him as the hearth master. So he's going to come in and visit. What's the first dish I want to cook for you today uh, from the Cochon Delay Festival? Well, what else? A fire-roasted pig. We have to cook that pig right on the fire. And this morning, when all of you were in bed, I went out early before daylight and fired up my old pit threw a lot of pecan wood, a little hickory on there, some herbs and spices, and I put my 70-pound pig in a basket, and it's hanging out on the patio in the fireplace right now, but I want to show you exactly how I did it because I want you to try to recreate this. Why not come on out back and let's see how my pig's doing. I'm going to show you how I cooked it. Come on. 
Well, welcome everybody to the outdoor kitchen here at White Oak Plantation. This is the best spot in the world to cook in this great New Orleans style patio. Or of course, under these beautiful pecan trees that throw the shade out on these fabulous old fireplaces. It's a great place to cook. And nothing better to cook than the famous Cushon Delay of Louisiana that we've been talking about. And of course, as I said earlier, there's so many different recipes for it. There's so many different people who actually cook it, but all people have one thing in common. All recipes have one thing in common. You have to begin with a great marinade that's gonna baste this pig all during the cooking process. So we're gonna begin with that. I'll start with a little buttery flavored oil in this old crock bowl, and then I'm gonna add some olive oil. You can use uh, vegetable oil, canola oil, any, any oil will work just fine. The secret is the amount of flavorings that you're going to add to it. I'm going to put in a little uh, Worcestershire sauce, and you want to add as much or as little as you would like, and then, of course, some nice hot sauce. People, I have seen people actually take a gallon of hot sauce and just kind of inject it into the pig all during the cooking process if they like it that hot. I'll, I'll rather things flavored a little bit milder. A nice... Uh, beer of some kind, because not only does this add a little more liquid to the uh, uh, basting uh, flavor, but at the same time, it gives a really, really nice flavor to the finished product. So you just want to kind of whisk all of that around. And then flavoring, I'm going to put a little salt, cayenne pepper again, how, how hot do you like it? A little cayenne pepper, cracked black pepper, a lot of granulated garlic. I love garlic, so I like to put a lot of the granulated. And then basil, thyme, let, let uh, your, the flavors that you like be the guide to whatever's going to go into this, uh, into this marinade. Just kind of mix all of this around. This is great to make the night before, too, because, of course, all the flavors are going to marry well. And then you're going to have a much more intense flavor if you do it uh, the night before. So just let, let all of that come together. And now your marinade is made. Now we have to flavor the pig. I'm going to begin here. But I guess about a 100-pound pig. I've seen pigs go anywhere from 18 pounds, which is the suckling pig, or cushion de lait, all the way up to about a three to 400-pound pig. So it, it just depends on the number of people you have coming over or, of course, just how big of an eater they are. So I'm going to go ahead and take the flavoring and kind of add it now all over the pig. You want to just kind of pour it on. Remember, this is where the flavoring is going to come from, and, of course, all during the process, we're going to be injecting this flavor. There's something called Cajun injectors. There's all kind of different apparatuses to put the flavor inside of the pig, like this little baby right here. You just fill it up with all of the nice marinade, put it into the bowl, pull it out, and fill it up. And then all during the process, you just kind of inject into the pig. Now, of course, we're going to go ahead and season the pig itself. Remember, this is a lot of bone a lot of skin, so you definitely have to over-season. Don't think you're just going to put a little bit of seasoning on this pig and it's going to be flavored enough. No way. Put a lot of it on there. A lot of the pepper. That real nice. Just get it all on there. A lot of garlic. Remember, a lot of garlic. Just pile it on. And once all of that's in, then you have to use your hands. You have to get amongst this meat by just going ahead and rubbing all of that butter and beer and Worcestershire sauce, the peppers, the garlic. And of course, once it's all in, then you can take your injector and inject into the hams, which are, of course, where the uh, largest and thickest piece of meat is. So you definitely want to get that flavor inside of the meat. So now that that's done, I would take it and take the pig and wrap it in a wire cage. Now you can go to a hardware store and just get a wire cage similar to this and just kind of bend it over and attach it with wires on each side. And this will hold the pig in position during the eight, uh, six to eight hours of cooking. The pig will take somewhere in the neighborhood of about five to six minutes per pound to cook over the fire. And I have one already on the fire, so let's take a look at it. And I, I want to show you some of the things you want to look out for. First of all, you can see that this is about a 60-pound pig. And we started off in the cage with the 
bone or the rib side into the fire because that's the most intense hot heat at the beginning. Then after an hour, we want to turn it around with the skin side in to go ahead and start to put a really nice crispy uh, gratin, so to speak, on the outside. The hams are the heaviest piece, so you want to finish the process with the hams down so they cook to about 150 degrees internal temperature. And of course, remember, Baste the pig constantly. Keep it basting with that nice marinade. I've even seen people take a bottle of beer and kind of shake it and shoot it all over the pig to make the skin really nice and crispy and crackling right at the end. Serve it with whatever your favorite side dishes, which we're going to talk about in a moment. I have a couple of them sitting already on the fire, and I tell you, why not go back into the kitchen because I want to show you what one of those great hams are going to look like when we take it off of the pit and put it onto a nice platter. I'll see you in the kitchen. Whoo, boy, I tell you, nice, warm, beautiful day outside, perfect for cooking. And look what comes off of that fireplace, that open hearth with all those wonderful hot coals. This is the back leg. This is the ham of the pig. You can see how it's nice and gratinated. As I say, this is gratin, or crackling, the very crisp skin that most of the oil has been uh, rendered from over those hot coals. And then, of course, the roasted vegetables all around the plate. And the most important thing, I think, in the cochon de lait is that you go ahead and figure out exactly how you're going to carve it, how many people you're going to serve. And it's very simple to do. You would break it down by pulling the two hams off, the two loins off, and just go ahead and slice it. As you saw at the cochon de lait festival, it basically just breaks apart. You can kind of pull it apart and it's ready to serve. But what flavor? You will never, ever taste flavor like the flavor in a cochon de lait cooked exactly the way you just saw it. So, hey, try it, and I tell you, we'll figure out if we can do one of those indoors maybe when Paul Keeney comes out in a little while. Okay, the uh, next dish I want to do for you from the Cochon de Lay Festival is a wonderful side dish. Actually, it's a beginning course. It's the white bean and tasso soup. Tasso is another pork product. It's the spiciest of all the Cajun meats. Tasso comes from that Spanish word, an antiquated Spanish word, tasajo, which means dried or cured meat. Highly seasoned in Louisiana with a little cayenne pepper, garlic, and all of those kind of things. And then, of course, we use it to flavor beans and green beans and potatoes, but most importantly, the white bean and tasso soup. And here on my platter, I have some of the sliced tasso. You see how nice and lean it is? This is a whole piece as it comes off of the, uh, uh, the screen in the smokehouse. You can see how it's been smoked here in very nice color. And then we can also use some sausages in here, some salt meat, or some bacon to start the process off. We have white navy beans. Uh, we soak them overnight, so they're uh, gonna, the cooking time will be about a third less than normal. So in my black iron pot here, I'm going to kick up my heat a little bit. I have some of that bacon fat because I started off just a little bit earlier. And you're going to want to saute your onions, your celery, your bell pepper. The same thing we like to always start dishes off with, onion, celery, bell pepper. And of course, this is a white bean soup, so put some color in there, any kind of color uh, you want. But I'm going to go ahead definitely and use my red and yellow bell peppers. And of course, my garlic, because we have to have a really good flavor in here. And remember that white beans came from Brittany. White, any dish cooked with white beans <clears throat> is normally referred to as something a la Breton, meaning from the coast of Brittany where the Cajuns came from. So naturally, white beans are a big part of what we uh, eat here. Can you imagine a Monday in Louisiana without red or white beans and smoked sausage or white bean soup? Wonderful winter dish, but we eat it all summer long, too. Once that's in, of course, I'm going to throw in some of the tasso, and I can just put it in whole, or I can break it up and dice it. However, I want that bacon fat, of course, can be eliminated in this dish with a little bit lighter oil or vegetable spray if you want to watch the fats, because the tasso is a very lean meat. Now I'm going to put in the pre-soaked white beans. I'm going to add those right down into the pot, and I'm going to have a little hot spicy pepper with it to kind of give it some nice heat. And I'm going to stir that around for a minute. Salt, pepper, again use your imagination, a little salt, a little pepper, a little thyme basil, you can throw some of that in there. But remember the flavor of this dish will actually be the nice smoke and spice from the tasso. Once that's in and the beans are sauteed for just a second, go ahead and put in some stock, chicken stock, water of course will do, you don't have the stock. 
put about enough water to cover the beans by about an inch or two and let them cook for about two hours. It's going to take a good two hours for this dish to tenderize nicely and then you want to continually stir the beans and add a little green onions and parsley to it and mash the beans against the side of the pot as you stir. Just mash them because as they get tender that will become the starch that keeps this dish together. After two and a half hours, of course, uh, you'll have to add more liquid as you go. Let me show you what it's going to look like in this wonderful old bean pot that I have here. This is really a nice old bean pot from early Louisiana cooking, and I have to get down in that soup. Look at this. Let me pull some of that out. Can you see that? Is that a gorgeous ladle of soup or what? I could get in that pot right this minute. Okay, that's a really wonderful little dish right there, and I really love that. What other dishes did I find at the festival? Well, two that I like a lot. This one right here is a, an orange glazed pork chop. Remember in Louisiana the Spanish brought oranges from, uh, from the islands and from the south and we use them in our pork chops and of course nothing's better with pork than of course sweet so oranges would always be a part of that. Now on my open hearth out in the back you saw a bunch of pots hanging behind the pig in the basket. This was one of them and look in this pot right here. This is my stewed turnips and pork with carrots and sweet potatoes and this just kind of cooks as a stew or a braise all down in that wonderful flavor picking up all the flavor of the turnips. It's a real country dish but definitely a dish found at the Cochon de Lay Festival and great to eat with uh, with the Cochon de Lay, with the roasted pork. Well, I told you I had a great friend coming to visit with me in the kitchen, Paul Keeney, the hearthmaster. He's a good buddy of mine. We go way back and He's going to come in and talk to us a little bit hey, about Cushon de Lay. Come friend. on in here. What do you have for me? Oh, you're going to be surprised. This is, going to, <laughs> this is going to take care of the mystery of making coffee from a green bean to the pot. Boy, I tell you, you have such great pieces of early cookware. This is a great, so this is an old... Uh, this what? is a coffee roaster. Coffee roaster. And the, the green bean is, yeah. is put in this part right here. Right. The greens, before they're roasted, have this color. Right. They're put in. Mm, I can smell it. You oh, must yeah. use it often. Oh, yeah. And, mm. and they're roasted to whatever degree of roasting right. you prefer. The dark roast, stronger coffee. D does it go in front of the fire or does coals this go in? This goes inside this basket. This comes out. Coals go under here. Right. And, of course, it goes in to the front of the fireplace to keep warm. Right. Well, I tell you, and then what happens? You grind them after and you right. just... Right. After, after these are the, referred to as parched, parched to a sufficient darkness, then they're taken and they're put in this fine coffee grinder. Oh, great. Here. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a beautiful old grinder, okay. too. So you're giving me these to take home with me, Oh, right? now, wait a minute. That has to go back <laughs> in my collection. What do I do if I, if I need a, a real old, old... Well, you can uh, come borrow it from me. Thank you, John. Thank now, you. Uh, you brought another wonderful piece here that I'm really intrigued with. Why don't you come mm. and tell me a little bit about okay. it here? All right. I'm very, very, very pleased to. This is uh, almost like a friend to me. I've had this a number of years, and this is a... a, a, a Fairly rare item. This is a, a rotisserie, just like you'd buy in a modern uh, uh, cooking store. Uh, this driven by an electric motor. <clears throat> this has a clockwork motor. If you lift the little right. lid, that has great big springs in it. It's wound from behind like a clock, Gee. and that in turn powers. This is called a basket, and the the cochon de lait, the milk-fed pig, usually is a smaller pig, anywhere from 12 to 14 pounds. And this expands and then tightens up. The pig is put inside this basket. Coals are then put under the pig so that it slowly turns and roasts. And roasting this method takes four to five hours, of course, depending on the size of the pig. And upon completion, it'll have the, the gratin effect, like you mentioned. Just, just, like, just, like just, the big, just like the big pig. You can also put, like, chickens or ducks or anything in here, chickens, right? Chickens, ducks, roast. Any kind of meat can be cooked in here, and believe me, there's nothing that equals no flavor like. Well, look, we have another dish to cook. Why don't we come back here? Okay. Thanks so much for bringing that and sharing that with us, because that's a an absolutely fabulous uh, uh, piece right there. And I always love your equipment because you have such wonderful pieces. But you know, one of the greatest dishes associated with the cochon de lait is the hogshead cheese. But so many people today are saying, ah, stay away from the yeah. fats, get rid of all of that stuff. True. Well, there's a way to make hogshead cheese without the head and without the fat. And on my platter here, I have a really nice pork roast. I have a great pork roast, a pork foot. And I have all of the 
ingredients here that I would uh, flavor it with the onions, all of these garlic, the garlic, the peppers, and all of that. And I have a pot here that's already all uh, simmering with all of the ingredients of the hogshead cheese right down in this pot. And the pot uh, uh, cooks the uh, rolls for about three hours until it's falling from the bone. And then, of course, we saute all of these nice vegetables and we add some of the stock to it. And let's take a walk right down here because I want to show you this. I have a little terrine here that has the pulled meat all in it right here from the, the mm -hmm. pork that came out of that pot. Mm -hmm. And I have the stock with all of the simmering vegetables that's been strained. It has some of the fat mm -hmm. in it. Of course, I've added gelatin to it to keep all of that mm -hmm. fat out. And I'm going to go ahead and put the stock right down in here with just flavored, ge unflavored gelatin. And I can add some of these really nice peppers, the green and the reds and all of those nice things to give it the great color. And when you put it in the refrigerator to gel with that gelatin, all the fat has been removed. And this is what it looks like when it's all done. I have a little platter of it right in front of us. Take oh, a look man. at that. Uh, some people call it sauce. Some people call it hogshead cheese. Some people call it scrapple if you live up in the uh, Pennsylvania area. But a wonderful dish coming out of the Cochon yeah. Delay. Paul, sit down right here and let's talk a little bit <laughs> more about... Um, Cochon de Lay and about open hearth cooking. I see you have another very interesting little piece here. What is this? Well, that's a, actually a bird roaster. I have to be very careful about talking about <laughs> because people are shocked when we talk about cooking birds. It was very common back in, in the 17th and 18th century to, cur to cook this, with this method common birds that we, we classify as songbirds today. Right. But it's used to cook quail, any other legitimate right. meat today. What a, what a wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful little piece. Now, you know, you heard me say about uh, uh, Napoleon soldiers coming to settle the town of Mansour. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's fact or fiction? Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Think you think they might have actually done oh, it? I, huh? I think so, and they brought some of that good French tradition with them. Paul, tell me about the uh, the, the outfit you have uh, on right here. That's is that an early? Well, uh, this costume? this is designed after a, a colonial period costume, and this was sort of it wasn't exactly all over the country, but uh, uh, this was used in the, uh, the the New England area. It was used in our part of the country, and it was it wasn't formal dress. It was like for a working person, and I work when I cook in the fireplace. Now, uh, Paul, you're a, a food historian, an antiquarian. What exactly is that? Well, a food historian deals with the history of food and how food got to the point that we know it now. And not only to, to the point that we use it, but how it evolved. And what about the cultures that, that developed this? So I learned something about that, too. How did you first get interested in the, uh, in the art of uh, open hearth cookery? Well, I got in mind because I've been interested in history practically all my life and went to festivals with my children and others and cooked for them in open fire. And I knew that there was a more advanced way, so I made a, an effort to go all over the country in different parts of the world. Well, where, where does one actually go? If I wanted to go out and find the best spot to learn a little bit about this food history, where would I go? Well, it, you, you have to go to historic sites help. A lot of reading and a lot of libraries, and a lot of libraries that, that lean toward the cultural aspects of, like, we have a lot of information on the Acadian culture here. So libraries, local sources. Now, you know, when I think of uh, <coughs> open hearth cookery, Paul, I think of those great big fireplaces I have behind my restaurant. I also think of Williamsburg and these kind of areas, but do mm -hmm. you actually need a fireplace so big that you can live in it like these big old-fashioned uh, fireplaces, or can you do it in a smaller one? No, it can be done a small one. Our ancestors, most of them used small fireplaces. They just didn't have the funds, they didn't have the resources to build big ones. So they made do with a small fireplace. What, what about special equipment? You have all of this beautiful antique equipment, but is there anybody who, I'm sure somebody out there is trying to reproduce some of this today, huh? Some is reproduced and it's available in hardware stores. Basically, you need two good cast iron utensils, a Dutch oven and a skillet, and you're in business. Just don't be afraid. Just learn how to manage the heat, and you can cook in your own fireplace. Now, you're not actually cooking on fire. I think a lot of people don't quite understand that you're actually building a fire to get coals, right? It's reflective heat? Right. Most, most of the fire is, and the heat comes from coals, not directly from the flames. Some of it's reflected, like you see in this little reflecting device that I showed you earlier. Paul, what's, what's the payoff? I know how much time and effort in collecting all of this equipment and all of that. What, what do you basically get out of? Well, the first thing is we get food that can't be equaled any other way. We have all of the, the aromatic qualities, the wood that, that permeates the food, and we have just the method itself of slow cooking. But for me, it's been wonderful because I get to teach, I get to meet people, and I'm the proud member of the new advisory board for the Nichols University 
Culinary Arts School, the John Fole School. Oh, and so that, to me, is a payoff. Well, I tell you, and, and you mentioned that, and I have to say that that was one of the main things I thought about. You have a historical uh, uh, culture. You want to mm -hmm. teach historical cuisine. And, my God, you had such a great knowledge. Mm -hmm. You were a natural uh, member for that. So thank you so much. Good. Paul, thanks a million for okay, coming to the kitchen and uh, uh, bringing all of these great things with you so that we could uh, play with them and share this with everybody else because they're so unique, and I can think of nobody else I'd rather learn it from and, and thank you for teaching me a little bit about it uh, also and thank, thank you, all of you for coming and visiting the fairs and festivals uh, with us and come back again as we continue to cook up more great taste of Louisiana thanks so much is that fairs and festivals I said yeah I think so <laughs> <laughs>for a taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarans authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarans, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. This is PBS. The companion cookbook to a taste of Louisiana is available for 1995. Chef John Fultz's Louisiana Sampler features recipes and history behind Louisiana's fairs and festivals. The cookbook contains 130 recipes, including those from this show, and over 26 full-color photographs. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.